Since 1987, Tim Boness and Stephen Wilson have been making music together as No Man. They've released albums of wildly diverse songs and atmospheres, from ambient to dance, and further out towards occasional, brutal noise. They've worked with some of the most respected musicians of the time, achieved sometimes remarkable commercial success away from the band, and critical success within it. A mood of melancholy tempered with black humour runs throughout their work. But despite it all, no man remain largely an underrated and best kept secret. They have always held the music um, as the most important thing, and that's been the driving force and the factor that has um, kept them doing the music they do. The thing that I have most respect for is, well, and this is true for Stephen as well, is the respect they have for what your intuition, your subconscious produces, and that they would go with that. Um, that there may be all sorts of practical concerns on top of that, but that inside there's something that you want to do, and you're going to do it somehow, and do whatever's necessary to kind of make that possible. I think no man have to be given respect for, for ploughing their own furrow. Um, they've, uh, they're honing their groove, you know, and they've done that on every album. It's become more, more, more rarefied and more exact. Both of them, I think, just so into music, listening to it and producing it, everything. They, they don't stop. You know, it, it's, it's just tired, tiring, knowing what they're doing, to be honest, let alone them doing it. It is incredible. Despite the musical sophistication, the majority of No Man's output is literally homemade. They work at Stephen Wilson's studio, No Man's Land. I'm sure that many people imagine it's some massive studio like you know, Angel or Air that's like thousands of feet square with all this up to, you know, amazing equipment in it. It is quite um, small, but the important thing is that the engineer, I, Steve, knows it inside out. Uh, but it doesn't matter really, does it? It's kind of a loop point. Well, I'll sort of try and count you in. The atmosphere of the room just makes it very relaxed and very comfortable. It's a very stress-free environment for recording. It doesn't feel like, you know, the clock's ticking and it's thousands of pounds an hour and some, there's, you know, an orchestra and, you know, the Rolling Stones banging at the door waiting to get in. It's just a, you know, it's a smallish room. You swallowed your pride Moved back to the town you knew The place where you'd hide when it all seemed too much for you. I think that both of us have always felt that you do what you do and then you try and get it to reach as many people. In other words, don't compromise the actual art, don't compromise what you do. And I think that it was that the fact for me why No Man worked better than any of the other bands I've been in is that there was a creative freedom and the fact that I didn't really need to discuss influences or direction. It created its own universe and it could effortlessly go from neoclassical to brutal industrial to freeform to a disco pop song. Have an o'clock. Okay. okay. It's seven o'clock, then it's quarter to eight. You'd get out of the house, but you've left it too late again. Any time we get together, there will always be that no-man personality and character, yeah, for sure. But and I also believe that it will always be different, because I think that we're right. continually absorbing new references. We're always open to the possibilities. When you're up, you try to find real love again. Oops, sorry. Singer-songwriter Tim Boness was born and brought up near Warrington, on the outskirts of Manchester and Liverpool, while Stephen Wilson grew up in the London commuter town of Hemel Hempstead. 
Living in the shadow of larger cities, both musicians struggled to find sympathetic collaborators. Teenager Stephen Wilson was releasing his own compilation albums of progressive music by local bands. I was in a band in Manchester and we'd had a few good reviews. And although it was actually more of a sort of experimental indie band, we'd been reviewed in a couple of progressive magazines, including one okay. in Italy right. and one fanzine that you read. Okay. And so Stephen sent me the first compilation album that he'd done, which was called Exposure. And in it you'd written a note basically saying that you were open to working with other musicians and that you were looking to expand what you were doing. So I phoned Stephen up and we had a long conversation about the state of music in, I think it would have probably been very early 87 or late 86. Tim, had, I think by that point, had sent me some of his musics and I'd really liked his voice and I thought, because I was still operating on my own really, in, from the bedroom as you say, so I was kind of using outside musicians and I, and I think I probably just asked him, would you like to sing this song on this record I'm doing? So that's probably the first time we met. You probably came down to do that. He'd written this track called Give Me The Needle. I'd learnt this. By the time I'd got here, he'd abandoned the piece. So we, just, awful. we just wrote this it's new awful. piece together. And interestingly enough, we had Faith Last Night, which is this quite epic, stately, ambitious piece of music. But she can't speak of what she feels Within her heart. And then Screaming at Eternal, which was this absolute jazz punk industrial slab of noise. So right from the off we were like, you know, hopping from genre to genre and just basically experimenting. As the band developed, Tim and Stephen were joined by other musicians, including guitarist Stuart Blagden, who'd played with Tim in a previous band called Still. I moved down to London in, in 1987 and uh, I kind of lost touch with Tim because he was still in Warrington and um, I seem to remember I bumped into him in a second-hand record shop in, uh, in Soho and he just mentioned that he'd met this, uh, this uh, keyboard player and whether I'd be interested in actually getting together with them and, and trying to do some, uh, some music and uh, I met Steve, liked what he was doing and it really went from there, really. Stuart was probably the best guitarist I'd worked with he was in, great. in the North he was West. Great. He was he, He's a very, very gifted guitarist. Yeah. And basically, he was trained in classical and jazz areas, but brought this to a sort of experimental, textual, rock area. Another recruit was Ben Coleman, a violinist who'd recently moved to London from Israel. There was something about the ad, I don't remember the wording exactly, but there's something that gripped me about it, and I thought, that sounds interesting, looks interesting, and I sent off my reply, and they sent, they sent a cassette, I think, with uh, three tracks on, and every track was a corker, as far as I was concerned. I thought, I couldn't believe my luck. And ben was somebody who would, would come along and sprinkle his magic uh, transform the song with this just wonderful, wonderful playing. Just a, I mean, just a pleasure to play with such an extraordinary musician. He was um, a wonderful live presence and obviously added a great deal to the studio recordings. You know, he's, he's a very interpretive player. We never had any question marks about his ability as a musician or what he added to the music, but certainly our personalities were very, very different. Ben Coleman became one of the three core members of No Man until his acrimonious departure in 1993. It was, it was wonderful. It was really, really wonderful. Um, in the beginning, um, yeah, things slightly deteriorated, deteriorated um, after that, unfortunately. Um, yeah. The majority of the band's earliest recordings were only released five years later under the name Speak. We would literally just 
splurge out music. I mean, five, six, seven pieces in a week. Um, and then he would go back and we would obviously talk by, by telephone. And gradually that kind of body of work that became Speak came out of that period. And we were both obsessed with this kind of, I, I remember we were both obsessed with this idea of recreating what we call, you know, what we thought of as this kind of music that had this quality of summers long since past. Nick Drake, Sandy Denny, Sandy Delly, early Nico, but kind of using the technology we had available, which was mostly sample based, to create a more kind of electronic take on that. It was sort of very atmospheric as far as I was concerned, which um, gave me a lot of room for manoeuvre. And being an improviser, um, it was like I had a, you know, my day has come had come and um, I, I just enjoyed, I just, you know, I was just enjoying myself so much. I, at last I found a group that I thought, you know, were worth their salt, you know, somebody, you know, with a little bit of, of ingenuity. And out of that came this body of work, which still, when I listen to it today, I still find incredibly easy to listen to and incredibly fresh. I, I don't feel any sense of embarrassment about it the way I do about what came immediately after that, which was trying too hard to be part of the, the zeitgeist of the time. The music we made us speak is, still sounds completely in a world of its own, in a good way to me. The band's first live performance was in January 1989. Ben would have possibly been the biggest motivator for us playing live in probably, some ways. Probably Ben would have said, actually. yeah, we've got to go and play live, yeah. Um, yeah. Because that was something that he enjoyed. I don't think we didn't necessarily considered it. Uh, I think I was terrified of it. Yeah, um, really terrified of it. So the first gig was was a wholly inappropriate pub gig in. Yeah, London. we did we did uh, two, we did this pub in Islington called the Rosemary Branch, and we did two sets. And certainly between the two sets, most of the people in the pub left. <laughs> well, I, well, I think what happened is, I mean, we decided that. And which, which I think is still the modus operandi, that basically we would do what we do as well as we could, regardless of the environment. So we took in this Young quite high art, yeah. high art statement into, into a, a working man's pub. Yeah, basically. an East End pub, basically. And so everything was linked. We had all sorts of tapes and voices. We improvised between songs. And um, yeah, it was fantastically stately, quite beautiful in its own way, but wholly inappropriate. Completely pretentious. Where, yeah, and I think... In that, that context, completely pretentious. I think yeah. the whole point is you've got to live or die by what you do naturally. And I think there's no point in... We died in, that day. We, we, died. we died a thousand deaths. But the next gig we did, we won the Battle of the Bands. <laughs> It's great, interesting to see. When I'm when I'm hearing it back, I kind of remember remember it quite well, actually. It's got a nice idea. I mean, the the keyboard, you know, the kind of the riff going through it is quite a nice idea, anyway. That kind of chugging little kind of rhythm, you know. Too much violin on it for my taste, but <laughs> but Tim looks pretty pretty confident, more confident than I remember him actually. I suppose we knew we were quite good, really. <laughs> the band's unlikely victory led directly to the release of their first single. In a way, 
it was a good thing to win because one of the prizes was to record in a studio for two days, a very good studio. Although the, the product we produced from that session was totally awful, which was the Girl from Missouri EP. Your face in the photograph was beautiful and pure. Your face in the photograph held the fires of the world. No Man is an Island. This will become known as the Girl from Missouri EP, which I played on the title track. I think it was just a, a song that just came out of, out of us improvising, and, and for a brief time we, we all liked it, and then I think we went off it pretty quickly after that, really. It was probably the cream of the live performances, the ones that, that people would <laughs> demand for the encore. And we recorded this, and um, it was horrendously overstated. I mean, certainly I would say that I'm the main villain of the piece. Oh, it's all awful. But it, it, It's just, it's like Tim says, until you hear yourself on vinyl, you don't really get a perspective. You can make demo tapes, listen to them in your home, your car, whatever. You think it's all genius. When you finally get back that piece of vinyl, finally you realise just how piss poor it really is. Stuart Blagden left No Man soon afterwards. I felt as though I was being too restricted uh, musically. I appreciated what they wanted to do, I understood it, but it wasn't for me what I wanted to do. But when he left, Stephen, who'd predominantly up to that point been a keyboard player, took over the guitar and it became more of a guitar band. You know, I was playing guitar during that whole period anyway. It wasn't like suddenly I'd picked up an instrument I'd never picked up before. In fact, all the bands I was in when I was even younger were I was a guitar player. Yeah, I remember the first time, I think it was in Ben's flat, watching Stephen play guitar, hammer away at the guitar, and it was clear that you know, he had a singular vision for that and wasn't going to let you know, what he might have seen as a potential lack of ability get in the way of him doing something. You're somehow expected as a guitar player to, to posture a bit more and, and ham it up for the audience, and I never, I never did. I do a bit now, but I, I certainly never did it then. So I imagine, although I don't remember, I imagine I was probably very uncomfortable about that but certainly felt more in control musically. But a far more significant change followed in 1990. Inspired by the musical trends of the moment, No Man recorded a single that would have a major impact on their career. Welcome to the phenomenon of Donovan. At the very end of the, of the 80s, there was the so-called um, Daisy Age rapping sort of scene. The bands like De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Jungle Brothers. So out of gangster rap in the 80s, which wasn't particularly interesting to me, came this new kind of more sensitive style of, of hip-hop music. And so I fell in love with the idea of using beats, and I loved the sparseness. And then suddenly you have these records which are little more than a couple of breakbeats, usually sampled from a 70s funk record, and a vocal. And I, I fell in love with that, that whole kind of economy of sound. Yellow is the colour of my true love's hair In the morning when we ride In the morning when we ride That's the time That's the time I love the best I think we were both excited by the production of these records and certainly the space in these records and we knew that we were going to bring something entirely different to it than Chuck D would. We love repetition, we love groove and it hadn't really come out in our music until that point which was, I suppose had been very white sounding music and suddenly the black influence started to come into the music, the hip hop influence mm. because of these these bands. So I started to sample, sample beats and put them underneath some of the tracks that we'd hitherto recorded in the old style. The first thing we did was was colours, which is actually very little more than a break beat, um, a violin solo. It's about it really in the vocal, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I just thought, let's try and go a little bit abstract here and um, just do, and I just did whatever came um, sort of to my head at the time and people seemed to respond sort of nicely to it. 
we, we both loved Donovan's work. We both had an interest in 60s singer-songwriters. And I think I'd read that the Happy Mondays were going to do a cover version of yeah. Colours, and I'd mentioned this to Stephen, and we thought it'd just be amusing to to basically record our version before they released Well, I think we probably thought it, it would be something that might get some attention from... I mean, oh, Happy Mondays were the band at the time. They were the band. Them and the Stone Roses were the band at that time. So I think we thought if we kind of stole their thunder, we might get some attention from some journalists, and so it proved to be. This is the uh, Single of the Week review of No Man's Colours from Melody Maker, August 25th, 1990. Uh, it's, to me, it's like, uh, you know, being a, a slightly older chap now, it reads like juvenile sixth form writing to, to myself, but it got its point across and, it, you know, it did make a lot of people very enthusiastic about No Man, so job well done. It shags along, I hope that shags as in the dance shags, it shags along with just a low breathy voice and intensely sparse drums for over two minutes before there's a split second perfect cascade of beautiful, beautiful violin and guitars and then everything ends with your archetypal choir of angels it's so gorgeous and addictive that the singer is king of the world for the next hour or so and I hope it does so well that Sean Ryder's sheepdogs have to retire no man exude the poison confidence the beloved want to exude 25 times on the record deck and rising I remember Chris Roberts phoning me up at, at my desk in my office in the company I was working for at the time and, and I fell off my chair, you know, because it was exactly in a way what we kind of hoped would happen, that just the fact that we'd done this and the Happy Mondays already, already announced that they were going to do it would at least get the record onto the turntable. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about, trying to get your record to the top of the pile when these guys must get like a hundred records every week. And it worked. It was quite a prestigious kudos thing to get single of the week in one of the two main papers. Um, and for an unknown band to, to get it, it was not, not that common in those days. So it was quite, uh, I imagine it was quite exciting for the band. For a time it was actually quite uncomfortable because Colours was really the only thing we had in that style. And uh, I remember Chris Roberts at the time was also working for a and for a company, an indie company called Dedicated, uh, who were part of RCA, and immediately recommended us to uh, to them. And I went. I remember going along to a meeting and thinking, shit, you know, we've got nothing else in this vein at all. And that was when I, cre I stuck the brake beat on Days in the Trees, and I literally did that the afternoon I went along to the meeting. It was a good move. One month after the release of Colours, No Man struck a deal with music publishers Hit and Run. We all felt that we wanted to, to do the deal. You could dance to it, you could listen to it, you could feel romantic to it, you could cry to it. It had everything. Uh, and I literally and metaphorically fell in love with what they were doing. The band then signed to the One Little Indian record label. I went in and had a meeting with Derek Burkett, the owner of One Little Indian, played him two songs, one of which was Days in the Trees. And at the end of it, Derek said, That's absolutely brilliant. I want to sign them. first single for One Little Indian was Days in the Trees. The thing is that the breakbeat made the song artistically stronger and we were very excited by that. So I think that although that had been done for the wrong reason, in that case it produced something that was really ambitious and actually worked. Days in the trees. John Wilde made it single of the week and out of that came that uh, wonderful quote of conceivably the most important English group since the Smiths. So it really was a hands-on involvement, a team effort between the band and myself to, to, to make it work and wonderful. I mean, things were happening every week. It was nice because that did create a buzz and then um, obviously more people um, came to see us live and it gave us, you know, it produced a momentum which, um, which gave the band a much needed boost. 
By now, No Man were frequently playing live, mainly in London, while Tim Boness's confident sound bites provided good copy for the music press. I remember being impressed by the backing tapes and the, the loops, the hip hop beats, Ben's violin, and then this weird sort of uh, the noise that was coming out of Stephen's amp, you know, I thought it was fantastic. And then topping it all off, you had Tim sort of prowling the stage with that kind of thing he does. Um, and it was, it was obvious that there was something quite special there. Tim is, is a fabulous lyricist, a musical inspiration, front man, uh, and of course is a fabulous uh, quote merchant when it comes to the media. Uh, and uh, some of the quotes from him from the sound of John Coltrane fiddling with trouser, uh, Janet Jackson's trouser leg and we are a Rolls Royce to the Stone Roses Skoda ought to go down in the great rock and roll quotes. But by early 1992, the three-piece live lineup of No Man was playing its final gigs. The record company and our manager insisted that we have a live band. I just suggested, partly as a joke to Stephen, that you know, perhaps we should get the people who were listening to. The musicians they had in mind were various members of Talk Talk, who'd just released their fifth album, and Rain Tree Crow, a band previously better known as Japan. And I thought, well, look, these are the most amazing rhythm sections I'm hearing at the moment. So I thought, let's go for both of them. And we approached both of them and we ended up getting managed by Talk Talk's manager, Keith Aspen at the time, who really liked what he'd heard. And we eventually ended up working with um, Jansen Barbieri and Khan. Former Japan members Steve Jansen, Richard Barbieri and Mick Khan joined No Man on a 10-day tour across England in autumn 1992. It seemed at the time like a perfect uh, solution to the problem. We were a guitar player, a violin player, a singer. They were a drummer, a bass player and a keyboard player. I guess at least two of them wanted to go out and play live again. Probably thought it was a little bit more progressed down the road than it actually was and, and agreed to do it as a one-off experiment. The tour's guitar technician was Tim's longtime friend and future No Man Live band member, Michael Bearpark. It was very, very accessible music at the time, even if some of the things that perhaps were going on underneath um, were a bit more um, artistically derived or whatever, or conceptual, then it was very, very physical music as well. In some ways, that's a, it's a challenging feat to pull off to have six musicians plus backing tapes sounding like music. No Man's live shows were growing in ambition and now included short films used as back projections. OK, so here we have a 16mm film can. It says Heaven Taste Print on it. I don't know what's in it, but I'm going to open it up and uh, hopefully it will be something, something connected with No Man, I would have thought. Ah, we have some, um, yes, this is definitely the No Man visuals. I think the first few gigs were probably just with stuff that I had lying around. Uh, and then, yeah, and then it got to the point where No Man had a little bit of money and they said, oh, well, you know, how about doing a video and how about actually, um, you know, sort of commissioning some projections for specific songs. Uh, so we were doing, so we made these 16 mil films to fit onto a song. I remember we did one where we dressed up everyone, uh, friends of ours from uh, characters from, from the Bible, like well, Christ for a start, and Mary and the devil. Some of the footage was reused in early 1993, when No Man released a single with Jansen, Barbieri and Khan. A life is sinking. There's nothing now can ever change. 
It was quite soundtrack style in that sense. Doing sort of projections for a sort of scuzzy garage rock band isn't really going to work with the sort of stuff that we were making for No Man. So certainly for my filmmaking aspirations, uh, it was fantastic because there were these big songs that we could create these uh, hopefully impressive scenarios for. Despite previous support from the music press and the presence of their guest stars, reaction to the tour was mixed. We had some good shows actually, but we also had some very quiet nights, playing to 40 people in a, in a venue in Coventry, those kind of things, depressing things. I think it was positive in the sense that it drew a certain audience to us and maybe gave us a certain credibility, but it was also negative in that from a press point of view, I think that was the beginning of losing something of the buzz. All the press, mm. all the publicity, all the live show promotion, it all came, and the, the, even the singles, everything became about their working with mm. the guys from Japan. But the tour was only the beginning of Richard Barbieri's links with the band. The keyboard player soon began work on Stephen Wilson's then almost unknown side project, Porcupine Tree. By spring 1993, No Man's profile still seemed to be growing, with a series of appearances on late night music shows. We've had a great number of very good reviews, but in realistic terms, we've sold about one and a half records, so, you know, poverty beckons. I don't think we've ever really been flavour of the month. I think that works in our favour. I think we've always had obsessive people who are interested in us. I think a little like bands like uh, Prefab Sprout or Pop or Vert, we've always had people who've supported us quite strongly, but there's never been a general consensus. And I think that works in our favour and that we will have um, fairly supportive reviews, but no kind of damaging fashion status. Love, love me. But in reality, the band's campaign for a career in pop was losing momentum. A series of singles followed Days in the Trees into the UK independent charts, and the band had some success in the US dance market. But none of the tracks broke into the all-important mainstream top 40, creating tensions with the band's British and American record companies. These are what are called our compromise years, and there's no doubt that we did things for the wrong reason. I certainly know I did a lot of things for the wrong reason. Uh, we, we all did. We did. And, think... and I was guided by him. So. Yeah, possibly. Possibly I, I had too much sort of saying things, and, and we did release some songs and some singles uh, for the wrong reason and, and got sucked in. I think we were all hungry for a little bit of, for a little breakthrough. Um, Everybody else seemed to be. Days in the Trees, I remember thinking, they've really cracked it here, this is a, a hit single. So I think it was odd when it didn't reach the mainstream charts. You're talking about signing to a label that are having number one hits with The Shaman, with The Sugar Cubes. And there was a lot of pressure, I think, to come up with things that would sell. And their biggest band was The Shaman. And I really liked The Shaman at the time. I, th I thought they were great. And I was kind of inclined to try and make sort of more high energy pop techno influence pop and Tim I suppose wasn't so into that and I, but I kind of pushed and pushed and while an Indian were pushing us too. Maybe you know industry people came to see them and thought oh they don't look like what's it, the flavour of the week this week or they don't look like the latest kind of indie band. I mean shoegazing was quite the thing back then bands like sort of Ride and Chapter House and Slow Dive and Lush and No Man were much more kind of literate and articulate and uh, ambitious than that. May 1993 saw the release of No Man's first full-length album, Love Blows and Love Cries. It was promoted by another tour. Several of the gigs were supporting a stripped-down lineup of Ultravox. I think that was probably the lowest of the low points, yeah. The, the desperation had really set in. New guest musicians were auditioned. Bassist Silas Maitland and drummer Chris Maitland were successful. Chris Maitland was a star, a bit like Ben. He was one of those musicians who came in and he was effortlessly musical and imposed his personality on the music. Finally got called in and sat on a sofa with Tim. And uh, I was sort of interviewed before playing, which was quite interesting. And their mu I think it was their music that was playing. Um, but we started to talk about Prince, I think, and it was quite exciting. I remember thinking, this is unusual. Normally you're straight in and playing straight away. I could tell it was a bit of a sort of quiz, you know. I, I kind of got the feeling it was going to be if I don't, if I answer with the wrong, you know, if I make the wrong answer, I wouldn't even get up onto the stage. His first work with No Man was on a late night music show. The manager rang me up, 
and asked me a few questions and was was I interested and I went off into a spiel about you know the, you know put my cards on the table he said never mind all that do you want to do some television I said what, when Tuesday oh yes <laughs> I dropped everything I dropped the deal I just thought television yes I'll do television with anybody Tim Boness later described the tour's more rocky sound as no man's motorhead phase. Ah, uh, yes, I heard about that. Yes, I suppose, you see, I never really was that into motorhead, but I know, I take his point. Um, but yeah, I, I always have and always will want to kind of be as much of a dynamo for a band, as much of the sort of energy as possible, both orally and visually. No Man's final full live performance until 2008 was in July 1993 in Camden, London. At one point we had a kind of rock dynamic, mm. but it wasn't really what the music was about. When we made Flower Mouth, I think it was a definitely a, a, a you know, kind of unconscious decision that if we can't play this live in the right context, let's just, just not do it at all. Flower Mouth was to be No Man's final work for One Little Indian. The album saw a return to their original musical values. I step out of the shadow And into the bright day I cannot breathe For the smoke And the city smells My head comes alive with We certainly got to a point where we reached the end of our tether and we said no, we don't care anymore, we're just going to make the music we love. We just wanted to produce the statement that we'd always dreamed of producing. We invested the recording budget in making our own home studio far more sophisticated and the whole control was ours and then the process was, was incredibly enjoyable, the musicians we worked with were fantastic, Mel Collins and Fripp were as good as we, we hoped they'd be. I was pretty awestruck by Fripp, I must say. <laughs> when he turned up here with his gear and his roadie, I was almost speechless. Angel Gets Caught in the Beauty Trap was like a fantastic piece of music as far as I was concerned. You know, I love the Frippatronics, I loved everything about it. 14 minutes to 5 on GLR, our live music, as I mentioned earlier, comes from a band called No Man, who have just released a brand new album called Love Blows and Love Cries. And what would you like to do first? Um, this first song is a track called Teardrop Fall, and it's off the album Flower Mouth. OK. <laughs> said why the dream and why the dreaming why try to get away when there's nothing ahead feel the way teardrops fall feel the way teardrop fall if we're going to fail, we're going to fail in big time on our own terms. We're going to make the album we want to make. And I think that there's an element that we might thought was the last opportunity we'd have. So, in other words, let's go down in flames. You know, we'd started the fire, basically. So this is a track called Watching Over Me. OK. Also on Flower Mouth. <laughs> I 
I look at your face You take me to the place Where I don't know anything Anything at all Contemporary pop should be about the present plus imagination and an awful lot of what we've got at the moment is the past minus spirit People now actually want to see bands that can actually reproduce their music live there's this kind of expectation now that if you cannot actually play your stuff in that kind of uh, acoustic environment, then, then you're not worth listening to anymore. Watching over me Watching over me Watching over me I feel that if I fall But Flowermouth was promoted far less than No Man's previous work. One little thing he didn't really get it or get behind it and I don't blame them at the time 94 when it came out it was mm. complete it was 180 degrees away from where they were they were having their biggest success with Bjork's first album Shaman um, I don't blame them at all you can already see on Flowermouth that this isn't the album one Little Indian probably wanted to release you know, they kind of got this um, and there are perhaps a couple of tracks which are an attempt to provide what one Little Indian want but nevertheless it's all within their own vision of things and I guess that that was the end. In my dreams, it's so clear. Without an official video, filmmaker Philip Ilson made a promo for what would have been a single. I look for my face. So there was always flowers in everything. I remember we bought bunches and bunches of flowers. Um, we were laying naked people in flowers. <laughs> Had they been massive at the time of Only Baby or one of those big pop singles, people would have had a certain perception of them and they might have felt a bit of pressure to carry on on that route. What actually happened, of course, is they went off on a completely different route and said, no, we're going to do our own thing and please ourselves. And I think that's, that's probably for the best. And the great irony being that although it was the album that One Little Indian really didn't want, it sold better. It sold better than the albums that we'd got the indie top 20 hits with. It actually reached genuine music fans. So I think it was a real beginning of an upturn. One significant, long-running tension came to a head during the recording of Flower Mouse. I really didn't hit it off um, with Tim um, from the word go, unfortunately, but we sort of, we respected each other, we respected each other's uh, sort of musical abilities, and then I felt that because um, Tim and myself did not agree on anything, uh, on everything, um, so to speak, um, Stephen, Stephen, um, was probably a little bit torn between his loyalties. We were thinking saxophones, we were thinking breakbeats, we were thinking orchestras, we were thinking hammered dulcimers, but we were in a band with a violin player, so everything had to be, at the end of the day, com accommodating for the violin. And ultimately, I think that became quite frustrating for mm. us. I think it's just a natural thing. If you're in a band, you want to be a part of the band. You don't want to be an outsider, con a contributor, or a hired hand. You want to be a part of the band. And when I realized I couldn't be that, I, I just wanted to go. We'd basically said to Ben that we were quite happy to continue as the live unit because we felt that was very successful, but that we would be picking and choosing on the album. So he would become a far less prominent part of the studio recordings. And he wasn't happy with that. And I'm sure as well that at Don't the time... Don't blame him. No, I mean, that was a... You know, you can't, I mean, obviously... <laughs> If, if somebody says to you, oh, by the way, you're still in the band, but we're not going to have you play so much, mm. I'd, I'd walk. I'd walk out at that point too. So he obviously was very upset about that. But, I mean, I do think it was the right thing to do because the music kind of blossomed in terms of arrangements and scope. When somebody um, very young wants to go on to be in a band, I don't know exactly what they want. And I, maybe they don't know what they want, but I didn't, that's what I got and I'm very happy for it. Signing to a far smaller record label, Third Stone, No Man were once more working as the duo that formed the band. Demos continuing the musical themes of Flowermouth were shelved in favour of more contemporary experimentation. Wild Opera, their third album, 
was followed quickly by a companion piece, Dry Cleaning Ray. 1994, we did three albums between us. There was um, Porcupine Trees, Sky Move Sideways, there was No Man's Flower Mouth, and there was an album that I did, The Richard Barbieri Flame. And they were all very beautiful, very glacial albums, and I think we were reacting against that. And this time round, we'd set ourselves certain tasks. As I said, we, we'd given ourselves an hour to write, record, complete a piece of music. And we did several of these experiments, um, which we developed further, and, and that became the basis of Wild Opera and Dry Cleaning Ray. And some of these experiments, we really hit some new areas for us. Although Third Stone aren't the biggest of labels, it just meant that they could be left to their own devices to make the album and say, there you are, there's the album. That's what we want to do. Here are the guest musicians we're having on it. You know, make of it what you will. The music wasn't the only element of No Man's work to change. Tim Boness's previously introspective pastoral romantic lyrics gave way to cynical urban observation. We'd always felt that we were artistically quite pure, but I was questioning, you know, what what was this I was doing? And I and I certainly came into contact with a, with a lot of people who, if you like, it was what fame had spat out. People had not been particularly successful, but there was an aggression, an arrogance, a madness in their eyes, and we certainly came across a, a lot of quite desperate characters on on the fringes. Of, of the music industry. Dry clean ray at the end of the day always knows what to say always knows what to play. You're living in London your income has been absolutely decimated and what you love is going down the drain and I'm sure that that was coming through in the lyrics. It's the same old song With the same old beer Thirty years without him Despite the change in emphasis during the mid-90s, Boness's lyrics have consistently drawn on his own experiences, particularly his traumatic adolescence. When I was 15, I kind of suffered from a sort of family meltdown where my, my mum was killed in a car crash. My grandmother, who lived next door, had three extreme nervous breakdowns in a row, and my grandfather, who lived next door, died. And what was quite a normal middle-class childhood was absolutely shattered within within a year and I spent a lot of time alone my, my I was an only child so my dad was tending to his ill parents and really from the age of 16 I lived alone and to cope with that I immersed myself in films literature music it became incredibly important music had always been very important to me but it became even more important and I guess it was a way of finding meaning when lots of other things had collapsed in my life. The stark imagery of Wild Opera and Dry Cleaning Ray's cover art was the work of designer Carl Glover. My dad started off as a painter and uh, he used to hang around with people like Francis Bacon and stuff like that. My granddad was a professional photographer, you know, my dad's dad. And, um, I mean, my dad took a lot of photos too. I mean, Mum as well. It's quite artistic. She used to do a lot of work in gold leaf and things like that. So it was perfectly natural. His sleeves have become almost as much a part of No Man's work as the music. I interpreted Wild Opera as, as life. And so we put this kind of 
idyllic looking to the future with you know sort of bright eyes slightly propaganda looking really photograph that i found on the on a medical encyclopedia from the 50s also suddenly they, they were on a label that didn't have much money to spend that that was a, a very very serious difference and uh, we, we had to uh, think on our feet tim uh, always wanted the the dry cleaners that gave him dry cleaning by ray uh, to be photographed for that. And there was a, a kind of movement uh, that was beginning, a kind of, you know, the roots of Brit art in many respects, this deadpan thing, which I always love. Probably the worst set of reviews we, we ever got was on Wild Opera, which I think confused people's ideas of what we were supposed to be as a band. And Dracling Ray, conversely, got very good reviews and was pretty much the same album in some respects. By 1997, one of the biggest factors affecting No Man was the success of another group very close to home. Stephen Wilson's once obscure solo project, Porcupine Tree, was now a four-piece band whose popularity exceeded that of No Man. I've never ever felt envy about the success in Porcupine Tree because most of the band I've worked with, most of the band are friends, and I think they're incredibly talented, and, and also I think they really deserve the success they have because they've worked at it in a way that I don't know I'd have been prepared to. There was perhaps a certain time when No Man's Star seemed to be fading and Porcupine Trees was rising, where it was difficult to deal with on some levels, but not due to any kind of envy or <laughs> any difficulty with the band themselves. It was just that my dreams were collapsing with No Man. And No Man sells better than ever now, you know, and, and part of that is the fallout from Porcupine Tree. But, you know, it, it's, it's inevitable that, that it, it, it now has been seen um, in, by some people to be in the shadow of something else. I don't like that either, you know, I'm, I'm in Porcupine Tree, but I don't like the fact that No Man is seen as that. And that's why... I say when No Man uh, are releasing a new record, I say I don't want to do any publicity at all. Tim should do it all. Because I don't want it to be seen. I want as much as possible to distance uh, No Man from Porcupine Tree. Nowhere was the distance between the two bands more clearly heard than on No Man's next album. Once more interrupting work on the material begun in 1994, Tim and Stephen instead returned to the first songs they'd written together. She would stare into the sun Screaming loud in summer heat. Sometimes reassessing your past is one of the greatest keys to, to fresh creativity and I've often found that sometimes as a starting point for writing sessions it's really interesting to go over something that you've never quite nailed. The kind of arc of, of our musical progress had almost taken us back to that spirit, starting with Flowermouth. Probably part of the process of making Returning Jesus was revisiting the mm. speak material, which is again, it's about texture, it's about space, it's about simplicity. And our music really hadn't been about those things for a while. Um, and this was the music that had endured as well, you know, this, some of this material we'd written 12 years earlier and I think that we it was interesting it was good, yeah. we, we still felt it was very strong because effectively with Speak, I mean it, it really is, with, with very few exceptions, it's the music as was in 87 to 89 but with my re-recorded vocals. And then you say There must be more
What can you say? A million ways to stay the same. No Man's next album of new material was released in 2001. Containing some songs that had taken the band years to complete, it was called Returning Jesus. Again, we decided that we were only going to release this album when it was right for release. We were going to work with the musicians we wanted to work with. We were going to release the songs we wanted to release. It was a, it was a real labour of love and we had no idea that there'd be any interest at the end of it, actually. We did spend a lot of years, seven or eight years, experimenting um, with things like hip-hop and high-energy pop and in, even on Wild Up, things like industrial music and trip-hop. And actually what Returning Jesus was for me was a return to what to where the the original creative relationship came from the the almost beyond genre slow it all down slow it all down it always moves I love the, the title track. It's so simple, it, it's, but it's, it just seems quintessentially no man. And I think for a long time before that, we kind of almost deliberately moved away any time we felt we were moving towards quintessential no man. Perversely, you might say. And Returning Jesus, we, we said, no, this is what we do. This is what we do best. This is no man. After years of very small record sales, the response to Returning Jesus suggested interest in the band was once more increasing. Luckily, the critical reaction and the fan reaction turned out to be the best we'd had since the very early days of the band as well. So that was an incredible relief, but it certainly wasn't done with that in mind. It was done with our own sense of satisfaction in mind. Little small pockets of people, they might be in Australia, they might be in America, they might be in Manchester, wherever they were, just a few people here and there, and it was growing again. When you go back and listen to Return of Jesus, for example, it, it's amazing, the, 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 the range of musicianship on it, and the styles, and the, the, the different patterns, and the influences, and the jazz stuff that's in there, the, the, all, all that side of stuff, it, it, prog stuff, um, and it all comes together in this amazing thing. As with all of No Man's later albums, Returning Jesus was released on vinyl. One of the things I, I really miss is almost the tea ceremony of getting the LP out of the sleeve, then the inner sleeve, holding it in a special way, putting it on the turntable and lining the arm up, and that little zen-like bit of faint crackling before it gets into the music. I used to love that, that, that anticipation. It's sublime. Yeah. But it involves you more with the music. I suppose, because you're doing these things in order to hear it. And because of that, I think you're putting more of an effort into actually listening to it. And when you do that, well, things happen. The relationship between Glover's imagery and No Man's music arguably reached its peak on the band's album from 2003, Together We're Stranger. Well, needless to say, I was this friend who came down one winter night and I suddenly thought about photographing him but not see, not him, he wouldn't show up, so to speak. And so he went up to Blackheath and I stood him in the snow and moved him and then ran around with a torch. I think it, it did provide a, a good space for that album. I do kind of see a funny sodium lit world <laughs> when I'm listening to that now, you know, totally because of that. The music was indeed in a world of its own, slower, more melancholy and more personal than ever. 
The title track developed after Tim Boness sang over one of Stephen Wilson's solo ambient pieces. We step outside and face the poison weather. And he sent me the, the tracks that he'd done and I expanded that into like a 28 long minute thing. Um, very indulgent, very progressive, very instrumental, very textural. And it became almost like a tone poem and the album really is all about that. I mean there are other tracks but that was the centerpiece of the record. I'm what you left behind I'm fading from your mind I'm what you left behind I mean, for me at the time I'd gone through a situation where a very long-term relationship had ended, my father had had a couple of strokes, um, this evoked memories of, of earlier bereavement. So in that sense, I think I was in the mindset that the album definitely speaks of. And weirdly enough, I think you were too. You appeared entirely sensitive to whatever was being expressed. And, and certainly for me, it was, it was just, it was evoking, you know, a lot of, of images of, of bereavement in all its forms, really, whether that's the loss of relationship or the loss of life of somebody you love, you know. Singing songs They'll never understand Tempo drifts In half-cut wonderlands I think perhaps the, the one constant throughout No Man's Career is, is that air of melancholy and that Tim's voice has a, has a yearning quality to it. It brings an air of... Um, understated drama to, to No Man's Music. There really is a sense of sort of very quietly, softly spoken pain and loss and regrets to it. Back when you were beautiful Back when you were beautiful With smile and shake For me, if you if you were going to pick an image that would kind of summon up No Man, um, it would be the haze of smoke that's left after the party's ended. Uh, without we didn't get too pretentious about it, too poetic about it. It's when the people have left. It's the kind of the feeling that the people leave, the ghosts of people. You're seeing uh, they're what they do in a way. You know, Steve quietly doing something in the background and Tim in this kind of cerebral universe, you know, sort of tapping into the things that have happened to him. I think there's a lot of that there. It's a kind of, it's the French pet shop boys, isn't it really? I'm going to get to Tim and the guys back on. Hey! Slaughter some No Man songs that they've perfectly rehearsed and worked out without me. After Together We're Stranger, No Man's work rate, to their admirers already painfully slow, decreased further as Porcupine Tree's success grew. The only visible sign of Tim and Stephen's partnership was a brief one-off live performance in Norwich in 2006. Look at the photograph. there was an intensity that as much as I loved what I was doing with my own band and thought it was interesting and as much as I thought that Stephen was very good with his solo guitar work for me it had a certain precious quality which I know you have a love-hate relationship with to a degree but it had a quality that was certainly absent from our own solo sets. The duo finally began working together again at No Man's Land in late 2007. 
the run-down streets, the civil wars You don't go there anymore It's how you Used to live To be honest, I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near as good as it was and I, I, was, I was very honest with Tim before we did it. I said, look, I'm, I really, I wasn't sure if the magic was still going to be there. I said, look, come with some songs and we'll try something. And within, I mean, it must have been within like an hour. We, it was like we were back, straight back to where we were, like 20 years before. It was like the relationship had, hadn't had this interruption at all. And I think we came up with all sweet things within the first couple of hours of just working together. magic kind of came back straight away and I think that's the great thing about the, the partnership is that we do have this this connection we've always had this connection and for that to have happened so effortlessly after five years of hardly having written a note together was extraordinary difficult for you to really find the interest to start projects and I think you were probably looking for a way not to do it. I was kind of looking for a way not to not do it but to make it easy on myself which is why I said to Tim you write the material you bring it to me and I'll kind of I'll work on it a bit and tart it up a bit and I'll mix it and that'll be a no man record but of course in the event what happens is that Tim brings me the, the, the material the raw material and I'm like, I'm either like, well, yeah, that's good, but hey, couldn't it be better like this? Or oh, that's a piece of shit. You need to rewrite that. And so inevitably, I was straight back in, and it was like the relationship had always been. It was mainly with Stephen Wilson that I did the recording. He likes me to experiment, really. I mean, he'll often suggest things like, we'll talk, why don't we try this instrument or that instrument? Or, you know, do sometimes do the opposite of the expected thing. We tried a few solos uh, on the flute. And um, in the end, the one he used was, um, there's something called flutter tonguing, where I, instead of having the notes straight, I'm going like that, this sort of thing. And you actually blow like that and then it comes out the flute you hear that sort of sound and that's actually the first thing you hear from the flute on on true north said to both of them I think it's a very strong album and I, and I really think it's it's great so I'm I'm kind of proud to be on it. I absolutely adore True North. It's very typically No Man and the lush textures and Tim's voice. A beautiful chorus. Absolutely beautiful chorus that makes me play that track over and over again. not like they're still trading on what they did 15 or 20 years ago. Um, School Yard Ghost is probably my favourite album, and that's the one they've just done. More than 20 years after their first recording, 
Schoolyard Ghosts has become no man's biggest selling record. It was great that 21 years after the first session, it was as effortless to come up with something that didn't seem like a repetition of anything we've particularly done. And it actually sounds like we're doing us better than we've ever done before. I feel that. And, and maybe, maybe the interruption, the five-year interruption, is partly why it's so fresh and it felt so definitively no man. If we'd been making records in that whole time, maybe it would have, it would have become more stale and wouldn't have had that freshness. You might hear the music and imagine there's lots of kind of sensitive stroking of beards going on, but it, it, realistically it's anything but. Um, you know, Stephen you know, won't hold back if he doesn't like what, what Tim's done. You know, if it's shit, he'll tell him. He'll just say, you know, do that again, or you know, I don't want to hear that. Or no, and bring in all sorts of you know, quite insulting comparisons to what, it, to what it sounds like. But because they can both do it, both give and take that, that means they've got a, quite an open working relationship. Yeah, the only difference on this is that between Pretty Genius and... Sorry, between is it True North? Yeah, it's Pretty Genius and True North, we're going to do all Pretty Genius. Perhaps the most unexpected No Man event of all occurred in 2008. Fifteen years after their last full performance, the band began preparing for three live shows. So right, every time we do a song, rather than sort of talking about it, let's just try and get on to the next one. And then exactly. Come back and yeah. Yeah. The memories for me of no Man Live are not particularly great ones from the early 90s. It was a period when I think we were struggling to reproduce what we were doing in the studio. We were slogging around the same venues that every band was slogging around. And Porcupine Tree were able to pull that off because at the end of the day we were a rock and roll band. No Man were never about rock. But joined by four extra musicians, No Man Live sounded far more rock than many expected. There's a track on Wild Opera called Time Travel in Texas. It's not the standout track on Wild Opera by any means. I just started jamming around with that at one of the rehearsals and came up with some riff that fitted. And all of a sudden things, it's like something fell into place. Um, and it's now got this really, really intense power that it didn't have on the original and to be able to do that with something that realistically is over 10 years old now um, not just bring it to life but give it a completely different life that's a fantastic feeling <laughs> The arrangements tended to be a little bit more fleshed out and a little bit more bombastic than perhaps some of the studio equivalents. But I think they had to be, you know, a, a, in a live environment, there is a very different dynamic. So things tended to get a bit more rowdy and a bit more rocky, but what was surprising about that is that actually it did work. In performing No Man's Music, although a lot of the musicians were actually from my solo band, um, they raised their game, they felt they had something that they were working towards and something that a lot of them already loved as fans anyway. And then when Stephen came in, it raised it that level higher again and I think what was really nice about the whole rehearsal process is that we seemed to get better and better as it went along. If he finishes his second Carolina on the D it yeah. means we're going to go D, C, then end on the next D. Yeah, it's D yeah. no matter what. Let's see what he does this time. Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying Tim accepts things that are wrong because he doesn't, but um, Stephen's got a, then comes in with a different perspective. Changed a little bit since uh, the last time I saw his set up, just a little bit. The final day of rehearsals also saw the brief return of a once familiar face. I thought, right, enough of being selfish, Ben. Fans are fans and a very, very important part in any musician's life, and I really don't want to disappoint them. I 
thought this long and you know quite silly feud you know between um, no man and myself is just getting silly and I thought well you know let's try and be positive and do do the right thing things are looking good you know I've I've never really sort of um, not spoken to Stephen I have lost touch with him but that's you know mending itself at the moment and everything's quite positive so um, yeah uh, here I am The first performance was at London's Bush Hall. The show was a sellout. Many fans had travelled around the world to see No Man returning. As soon as they announced the gig and said it was a one-time deal, that I mean, what were we going to do, say no? These are emotions coming from his music and lyrics and the Tim, Tim Bounds voice. I came from Chile and uh, I came because I have followed the music of Noma for almost 18 years. It's United Nation here tonight. It's amazing, it's crazy. I like it. It was a pleasure because no men are part of my life and it was very, 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 very special to see them live. Uh, just a sort of conclusion of, a, of an era. There is one word, mesmerizing. Yeah. It was excellent. It was like a dream come true, you know, because we have been waiting for 10, 15 years to see them together. The band then played the Netherlands and Germany. No Man's first shows outside Great Britain. I had a vision for the live band and it was realised. The one thing I really loved was that we managed to come out and have this, this very contemporary rock element but with a contemporary classical um, aspect that I think was brought in by Steve Bingham, the violinist who comes from an exclusively classical background. It's sort of, it's sort of um, art rock with a progressive slant what you're saying. It's progressive art rock with, yeah, with elements of country. No, it's country. Yeah. No, it's folk. No, it's, <laughs> it's pop with, yeah, it's prog. I think what we proved is with the right circumstances and the right people, we can take you know, the world of No Man, the magic of No Man, into a live context. For the first time ever, really. So I really enjoyed it, I think it was great. For me, the most exciting legacy of the live band is that I heard yet another new sound and yet another new set of possibilities for No Man, which perhaps might even dictate where the next studio album goes. I was the one resisting it for years and then by the end of it I felt like shit if I wish we'd done a few more now.
think if it was a if this was a Hollywood movie, there'd be tears in the eyes and a happy ending about the you know the the happy resolution of the story, or, or for now. For now, no man have returned to the studio named after the band. I just can't get my head around your concept, man. For me, it's always been uh, kind of irrelevant, you know, how the, the partnership works. It, it works, that's the important thing. The sound could not exist without the two of us, the, the kind of melting of minds, as it were. Other people lose it or never develop it, um, and they never keep that kind of imaginative quality going. Whereas, for, you know, for both of them, I think there's that sense of imagination, spontaneity, possibilities of what you can do with music. I can think offhand of several directions the music could possibly go into, and also the fact that we could just get excited again by, by new technology, new possibilities, or even just further develop the sound world and emotional universe that I think the last three albums have been investigating. I don't see any reason why that can't be done. Well, I like the way you're going. Minimalistic. Yeah. The but drummers are jabular. I assume you'd want some harmonic reference for the voice, though. 20 years of working with him, I've only lost my temper with him maybe like twice. Shall I go for a two-hand pump? Make sure you're pumping when I start my okay. performance, though. Vigorous or slow? Two, three, and four, and... It's a lot of fun because there's no real way either of us can offend the other um, in terms of the ideas we might come up with or what we might say about each other's performances. Um, and I don't really have that relationship with anyone else. And it makes it a lot of fun, and it makes it really easy, and, and it makes it very secure. I suspect as time goes by, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll get bigger. I just hope it isn't one of those things that one of them has to die in order for them to sell products, <laughs> you know, which would be a bit bad. Of course I want people to be moved by what we do. I, I want people in some way to be challenged by what we do, I, but I, I, th I think essentially I, I want people um, to feel it. I don't think John Wilde was wrong. They were conceivably the most important English group since the Smiths. I used to say, you know, yesterday's alternative is tomorrow's mainstream. Well, they've just had to wait a long, long time for tomorrow to come around, but it will. <laughs>